Hello again, I'm Enrique Martinez Meyer. I'm a professor at the National University of Mexico here in Mexico City and I'm very pleased to be here in the 2020 edition of the Ecological Niche Modeling online course. Thank you Tom for the invitation to the course and this time I'm going to talk to you about I think which is my favorite topic in, in this field which is uh, modeling abundances. I hope you enjoy the lecture. lecture. Let's start with the presentation. The question here is if ecological niche models can be used to estimate the distribution of the abundance of species across its geographic range. And I think the first person to address this question, at least in these terms, was Jeremy van der Waal from Australia, and he used Maxent and uh, he had a set of species with abundance data across its, its ge the, the geographic ranges. So what he did was to model their distributions and uh, relate or, or correlate the uh, environmental suitability of the models with the abundance data uh, using a quantile regression analysis. He one interesting result is that he observed this triangular relationship between the suitability and abundance, meaning that at, at higher uh, suitabilities he found either low abundances and high abundances. So his results show that only the upper quartile of this uh, uh, regression analysis was able to have a significant relationship with abundance. Then uh, there was some criticism to this analysis and uh, Alberto Jiménez Valverde uh, uh, replicated this analysis with a different algorithm, algorithm with a neural network and for, for 48 arthropod species uh, but he couldn't find this relationship between the, the modeling al algorithm uh, output and the abundance of species. Uh, a few years later, in, in this study by, by Natalia Torres and a group in, in Brazil, put together a database of uh, density estimations of, of, of jaguars across its geographic range from Mexico to South America. And they tested uh, all these different algorithms to see which ones were able or if someone was able to, uh, get to catch this relationship between, between the suitability scores and the abundance of the Jaguar. And they divided in, in two sets of, of data, their analysis. They have this, this 37 data group as a complete data set, but then they have this subgroup of 17 uh, sites with, with very well controlled density uh, estimations for the Jaguar. So in this data that they have good data, they found that only Bioclim and GARP were able to find a significant relationship between the abundance, well, the suitability, and the abundance. Uh, then there, there were some other studies in these years, but uh, then was this, this is an important one, this is a meta-analysis in which they analyzed all the studies at the time that were looking for this relationship between niche models and, and abundance. And what they found, it's as you can see here, there is a lot of variations uh, among the studies and the species. But uh, their conclusion was that they, yeah, that there, there's in general a positive relationship, sometimes weak, but in, in the 20 something percent, the, the mode of this. In which, in which you can find a, a significant relationship between uh, abundance and, and the suitability scores. Well, 
the general methodological approach for doing this type of analysis is that first you have a collection of, of localities in which you have uh, abundance data across the geographic range of a species. Then you use a different set of data, not those that you have uh, with abundance, occurrence data, and you produce a niche model with the, the algorithm of, of your like. And uh, then you extract the suitability values at the pixels in which you have the abundance data, and then you do a regression, some, some sort of regression analysis. It can be a linear or non-linear regression uh, to find if to, or, or to, to see if there is this uh, relation or correlation between suitability and abundance. Okay, this is the general way the, the people have been doing this. But this is not a new topic, of course. There have been decades in which people have been observing and thinking what is the, the, the relationship between the abundance and the distribution of a species, and this is a very uh, interesting and important work on this, a landmark work by uh, Jim Brown. And what he found in, in his analysis, of course, there were no niche models in this time, uh, but uh, in, with the field data, he, he observed like general patterns on, on this. First, he, for many different species of different taxonomic groups, he found that uh, most of the sites where species occur have uh, relatively low abundances. But there are some very few sites in which abundances could be mag or orders of magnitude uh, larger. These were called hotspots. Of, of abundance. Another pattern is that uh, there is a strong mm, spatial autocorrelation in, in the abundance. Nearby sites have similar abundances that sites that are farther away, which is also something expected. And there is this the classical uh, Central peripheral uh, relationship of the abundance in, in geographic space, in which at, at the center of the geographic distribution of the species, you, you could find higher abundances than to the peripheries. And particularly this one ha, have, has been used a lot in biogeography and ecology and evolution more like a tenet, more than a hypothesis that need to be tested. And some other studies um, later demonstrated that this is not always the case, of course, and could, be, could not be uh, considered a, a, a biogeographic rule. But sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. Well, but uh, what I really don't like of these studies of relating niche models with different algorithms against abundance is that people, people are not thinking on the mechanisms that produce this relationship or not. It's, it's only to find this relationship to see if we can use, for example, Maxim to model the abundance of species. But why why it happens or why why it doesn't it doesn't hold? Well, and there have been different proposals in the last decades to try to explain why uh, there are some sites with higher abundance and others with lower abundance, and they, these are some of them. You know that local abundance is largely a product of the dispersal dynamics of individuals. So uh, dispersal is, is one of the main drivers according to this, this hypothesis. Well, there is another one uh, proposed also by, by Jim Brown that uh, the population fitness 
is the response to one or, or, or more, but few in general, critical environmental variables. And the same uh, Jim Brown proposed that the spatial variation in abundance reflects the extent to which local sites satisfy the niche requirements of a species. The niche requirements in terms of the Hutchinsonian niche, the, the um, uh, multivariate ecological niche of the species. And uh, this is what is really interesting to me. Uh, if, uh, if there is a relationship between the ecological niche of the species and the abundance, how does it work? Well, if if we go back to the basic theory of the relationship of of a, of a population to the to one environmental variable, and uh, the performance of a population is reflected in abundance, you could expect something like this, like this, this Gaussian uh, relationship in which you have like uh, suboptimal and optimal uh, ranges in the gradient of this environmental variable. So there are some some uh, ranges or intervals of, of, of values of this variable in which the species performs the best, the optimal conditions. Okay, this is in in a univariate. Uh, fashion. But if you think this in a multivariate fashion, which is not new also, uh, this was uh, proposed and thought by, by Bassett Maguire in 1973. He found that uh, in general you can find the maximum um, birth rate of a species towards those combination of optimal conditions in in this case is a bivariate environment so uh, here at the center of this bivariate uh, space with two variables you can find at the centroid of this of this space in this optimal space where uh, the birth rate is maximized and the death rate is minimized. So you, you could expect the highest uh, population uh, abundance in this, in this section of the ecological niche. And as you move farther away from the centroid of the, of the ecological niche, you would expect that birth, the birth rate would decrease and the death rate would increase. So, uh, in general, then, you would expect an inverse relationship between the distance to the niche centroid with the population fitness. And if the population fitness is in some way related to the abundance, you would find this inverse relationship between, between abundance and the distance to the niche central. Well, these ideas, although they were proposed by, by, by Maguire in, in a theoretical ground like 50 years ago, uh, we are retaking these ideas now and implementing them with ecological niche modeling but although now this is a very hot topic and a very interesting one and there is a debate surrounding this etc these are also not new not, not new ideas we started to think on this and i'm talking about uh, town and me when i was his phd student I don't want to say dates because town is old and I'm not, but it's about 20 years ago, I think. 
that we started to think on these ideas and we first implemented or tried to implement this and didn't work in our first attempt. Uh, so Tom said, no, no, you forget about this idea. I think it's not working. But I was, I was with that, with this idea uh, that we did something wrong in our first try. So, well, I kept that idea in my mind. And after I graduated and became a professor at the National University of Mexico, I retook that with one of my students. I, I'm going to talk to you about this. But the, the general idea is to test this hypothesis if, if there is an inverse relationship between the distance to the niche centroid and the abundance in a multi-dimensional space, of course. So this is the student that I'm talking to you about, Daniel Diaz. So I convinced him to, to work on, on this idea. So what we did was to find uh, a bunch of, of species with, with uh, abundance information across their geographic ranges and we, we went to, to the breeding bird survey in the, in the US. And we started with this very emblematic species, uh, the Toxostoma redivivum, which was the California thrasher, was the seminal paper on the niche by, by Joseph Greenell. So, so uh, what we did in that time was to collect this, this uh, occurrence data with abundance associated to, to them, and then, well, to have our, our uh, set of environmental variables that we thought we, in that time we didn't test that those were the most informative but we used some of those and then model its ecological niche as we do it now in those times it was with GAR. We obtained the potential distribution of the species so we extracted from this potential distribution map we extracted all the pixels that predicted the presence of the species and extracted the the values of, of all the environmental variables that we use. We standardized those, those values, so all have the same uh, the same way to measure them. And we estimated the multi-dimensional niche centroid of, of that set of variables, and then uh, we calculated the distance from each one of our points in this environmental space to the, to the niche centroid. We used in that time the Euclidean distance, but uh, more recently Jorge Soberon and Luis Osorio have demonstrated that of course this is not the best way to measure the distance in a multi-dimensional multi space that has uh, maybe or that has correlation or some correlation or some other correlation among the variables. So the, a better approach is to use the Mahalanobis distance. But in, in the, our first uh, stage of this, we were using the Euclidean distance. And what we found for this very first species is that we could find actually a relationship between the distance to the niche, niche centroid and the abundance, an inverse relationship, exactly what we were expecting from our hypothesis. So that was pretty exciting for us. Uh, then we compared this uh, relationship uh, against the geographic distance between the geographic distance and the abundance and we we observed that we didn't find a, a relationship and we also a model with Maxent to to see if there is a there was a, a positive relationship between the scores from from Maxent the probabilities estimated by Maxent and the abundance of and we didn't find also a strong relationship. So this was 
a pretty exciting result. So we tested many other species from the breeding bird survey. And in general, we observed a higher um, or, or a stronger relationship when we use the distance to the niche centroid than when we used uh, the maximum probabilities or the geographic distances. You can see here in this in these uh, slides, you have to take uh, a look here to the R squares. And you will see that that in every case, I think almost almost all of them, we found a stronger relationship using the distance to the niche centroid here. You can see for this other species with maxent and with the geographic distance and so on. Then we wanted to make sure that it was not something about the breeding versus survey data. So we looked for, well, Daniel looked for other, uh, other species and we, he found data on, on the wolf in, in North America, at least in Canada. And it was the same, the same pattern. In this case, it was pretty, pretty strong because uh, luckily for each uh, occurrence data with abundance, we also had a, a data on the abundance of, of its main prey. I think it was caribou, I think, or elk, or one of the of the ungulates that the the wolf prey upon. So. In addition to the, cli the climate, the climatic variables, we also had uh, information on the on the prey. So this really increased the strength of the relationship, and we found the um, monkey and a monkey and a toad. And, and you see the the pattern, the pattern, the pattern stood uh, all the time. So that was pretty exciting. It took me years and years to to publish that first paper, and in this process, there was another student of mine, Carlos Janis, better known as Lichos, who was also interested in this topic. He he was doing his PhD with me, and. Uh, uh, we decided to test these ideas with field data that he was uh, obtaining by his own for the white-tailed deer in, in a small uh, region of, of Mexico. So in this case, uh, he used uh, uh, different methods in the field to estimate the density of, of the white-tailed deer and uh, well, the, the, the results were also positive. We found this inverse relationship between the distance to the niche centroid and the density of, of, of the deer estimated in the field. So we were learning a lot doing, this, doing these exercises or these uh, analysis. First of all, we we learned that uh, this special variation of abundance uh, was better explained by well, by the niche uh, or the internal structure of the niche than by the geographical structure of the data. And uh, this was very useful and very uh, informative too. Then uh, we we looked for for uh, help from st a professional statistician Miguel Nakamura from uh, uh, Math uh, Rich Research Center here in Mexico to understand better the the numbers of this relationship. So he he did several simulations with uh, uh, like a virtual species if you want to call it like like that and what he found found out is that uh, this relationship between 
the distance to the niche centroid and the abundance was better modeled and explained by a multivariate normal distribution, which is probably the easiest one. So it was a, a, a good news also. So this is was this was uh, like the first stage of of these ideas, and uh, later people smarter than me started to work very hard on this, like Jorge Soberon. You you have another uh, presentation of Jorge on this topic, the theory, the theoretical background. And uh, one of the young young scientists that has a lot of promise, Luis Osorio, and uh, they have very strong mathematical background, and, and Jorge has a very strong theoretical ecology background. So they have been pushing very hard on, on these ideas and, and like formalizing some of, of, of these ideas in in uh, numbers, in terms of, of mathematics, and also investigating what makes this relationship uh, to work or under which circumstances you can expect that this relationship, this relationship uh, holds and when wouldn't work uh, and uh, they have uh, proposed different Things, different ideas, for example, that the, the fundamental niche has to be a, of, of a convex shape and since then we are representing them like uh, ellipsoids and the internal structure of the ellipsoid and you can calculate the centroid and the distance of any point from or, or within this this ellipsoid to the to the centroid of of it, and uh, actually because Luis Osorio is very good at programming in R, he already developed this this modeling system called Niche Toolbox, in which he has implemented this idea of the ellipsoids and uh, the scores actually that you obtain from modeling with ellipsoids, it's already a normalized uh, uh, score that represents the distance to, to the niche. So these have been very important progress uh, and not, not only in the implementation but also mm, they have proposed different ideas on, on how this can, we, how can we understand all, all these all this uh, internal structure of the niche and how it uh, can be used to explain fitness of the species and uh, the abundances among them. So, uh, in the course of these years, we have uh, tested this, these ideas and these hypotheses in different ways. These are some, some of the papers that we have produced using this approach with positive results and, and for different purposes you can see here. But also, of course, there are negative results and there are uh, research groups that don't believe in this relationship because they have, their, they have done their own testing and they have not uh, they are not convinced on these ideas and this is now a, a very interesting debate and controversy that uh, Luis Escobedo and Angela Cuervo explain in their presentation so I'm not going more on this but uh, what I want to say here is that this is a very active research area now and uh, this controversy and these debates are very useful for, for progress in our understanding of all this. Well, let me tell you of all these ideas that we have developed in, in all these years, 
what is what I think about uh, when this uh, this uh, all ideas of of the internal structure of the niche as the main determinants of explain the fitness of the species and uh, when abundance is an expression of the fitness you can use niche models to uh, predict or to model and predict the distribution of abundance well in one of these uh, testing by by Carlos Yanez by Lichos uh, with Jorge Lobo they were uh, with a, a simulated species with a virtual species for which they uh, mo well they produced a, an abundance a pattern of distribu distribution pattern of, of abundance across a, a landscape it's a virtual spe species everything was controlled what they they moved there was the sampling effort and bias so they observed in, in their results that when you have a good uh, sampling across the whole range of the species which is in this case you can find this more or less clean relationship between the distance to the niche centroid here and the abundance but if you start to having uh, geographic biases on your sample and also incompleteness in your sample what you start to see is is these triangular relationships as you can see here so the same thing that Jeremy van der Waal observed in his first uh, in his first paper about this so it this this triangular relationship that that the Jeremy van der Waal found he he well he proposed that could be uh, due to some local processes that these large-scale analyses do not capture for example uh, interactions no like parasitism or, or predation or something like that that occurs only at the local the local scale well what what Lichos uh, could find with his analysis here is that probably is, is a problem with with the structure of the occurrence data then uh, if you see the presentation by Luis Escobar and Angela Cuervo you can also see that there are other factors uh, related to, to how we model the niche and how for example how different algorithms would, would represent the fundamental or the realized niche of the species uh, how that would affect the position of the centroid and then and thus the the relationship between the distance to the niche centroid and the abundance that that could be another factor that that uh, introduce introduces noise to this to this whole idea and this relationship well some of the very interesting uh, analysis and simulations that that Luis Osorio with Jorge Soberon and Manuel Falconi have uh, have been doing in these years is is to test some some hypothetical scenarios of in in a meta population context. So how dispersal and uh, other demographic factors, for example, the Ali effect, can affect this relationship and what he what they found is something very very obvious obvious when you already know that but not not, not beforehand is that uh, when there are some uh, transitory states of the populations or or populations that are not in equilibrium with the environment of course there are for example, uh, some sites or some places with very, very good conditions wh where you would expect very high abundances. But if there are some dispersal or establishment issues, this would, would uh, cause that the population numbers wouldn't be 
as, as high as expected or the Ali effect also. So these uh, demographic and dispersal uh, situations that you can you can uh, expect that in the real life make that uh, this relationship doesn't doesn't uh, hold all the time and well also these local factors that we are not considering or other uh, other factors uh, aside the uh, climatic conditions or the abiotic conditions that we are using for modeling the niches, for example, the interactions. And there are some other factors related to the to the niche, to the uh, how we model the niche. For example, uh, if we have a deficient representation of the niche, as I told you a, a moment ago, in some some geographic scenarios that are not convenient for for this uh, this uh, for for the niche to express fully in a, in a species. For example, if you think in an island that the species only lives in that island, uh, probably its niche is is much bigger than the conditions that the species can find in the island. So so it, it's this is a truncation of the of the niche, and you wouldn't expect in those situations that this uh, relationship holds and this is something that I'm working on now and what is the effect of having non non Gaussian uh, relationships like this one some relationships that, that are saturated uh, here the the optimal conditions for this species is not at, at the mean or at the center of the of, or in this response course like like here but probably the optimal conditions for the species are at one of the extremes of the values of the environmental variables things think for example in in plants in the desert in which you like the Atacama desert for example that you can have for years no rain so the plants that live there would have like uh, if this is precipitation here for example you would have a response curve like like this like this exactly the opposite of, of the one that we are looking at here so uh, the optimal conditions for the species are in in very low in very low uh, precipitation and you would never have this this belt shape uh, response so how these relationships to the environmental variables affect this relationship between the niche centroid and and the abundance so uh, in a new, a very new delivery by by Jorge and Town in theoretical ecology in the journal of, uh, called theoretical ecology, they explore other or other ideas uh, related to how how the fundamental niche relates to the realized niche and and when the the niches are not like like uh, or the states. In the state of, of a population in the niche is not a point in the niche, but but more like like something uh, more dynamic. Uh, things that are more complicated for me to understand. But there's these are other complications that could affect this this uh, relationship. So as you can see, there are many possibilities to to do very exciting research in this specific field of of ecological niche modeling that's why it's my favorite part of all this uh, just to think in the possibility that we can model the abundance of, of species the, the geographic patterns of abundance of a species 
it's it's very exciting because you can think of, on all the possibilities that this opens for both for for theoretical science and for applied science instead of modeling distributions of where the species is or where where are the best conditions for species to be if we are able to model and to map the distribution of, of the species gives another dimension to the information that we can get from, from this. Um, think in your favorite area, for example, conservation. Instead of having these uh, maps of the potential distribution of the species, having maps of the potential abundance of the species would be much more informative and useful to make decisions. And uh, this debate with our colleagues that are not uh, convinced with these ideas, I find it very useful because this is forcing us to think more carefully and to make more uh, careful our analysis to, to make sure that we are doing and thinking right on this topic. So this is uh, pushing uh, all the all the, the uh, abundance modeling field forward and this is of course very good so this all this is what i wanted to, to share with you this this occasion thank you very much for your attention and here is my my email if you want to to contact me thank you very much